Um, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me uh, to this conference, to the panel. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, let me uh, first say that um, I'm here in my private capacity as a researcher at the ECB and in no way should what I say be constructed as an official view on things. Um, with that disclaimer, um, what we're doing here is we're just going to argue that even though by law the ECB um, is not um, the official lender of last resort to your area, banks at least, you know, prior to the establishment of the banking union, the way it acted and the way it responded to the crisis means that de facto it, it very much was, and hence the title, the lender of last resort is uh, how lending of last resort does. And what we're going to examine how this um, lending of last resort impacted um, the interbank market, how banks um, lend to each other. So um, just uh, as, a, as a motivation, um, the, um, the euro area interbank market essentially became very dysfunctional uh, in the financial crisis. What this chart shows, the red line is, is uh, one rate um, among, among banks. It's the three-month unsecured uh, rate, and it's uh, taken as a spread over the risk-free rate. So this is really a, a spread that, that banks charge to each other. And you see that prior to going into the financial crisis, the spread is essentially zero. Interbank lending was deemed to be riskless. And then it jumped, and a um, couple of weeks after Lehman, it go went through the roof. So interbank markets um, became severely stressed, and the blue bars are something that I'm going to exploit uh, in this work. It's essentially the amount of um, central bank money that is, that is out there and how does it affect um, the way banks um, trade with each other. I need to kind of um, open a little bit of a parenthesis here to make the point that the ECB de facto acted as a lender of last resort. So prior to, um, to Lehman, so October 2008, so on the left of the arrow, we implemented monetary policy through auctions. So what we do is we calculate the reserve requirement of the banking system, and then this amount of money is auctioned off um, mostly at a weekly uh, interval to banks. And um, there's a minimum rate at which you have to auction. At the end of the auction, it's the green rate. It's called the main refinancing operation rate. And what you see is that um, the rate in the market that, that then occurs is very, very close to what we impose in our auctions. That's how we implement monetary policy. There's two more rates that will play a role, but in normal times did not much. There's sort of an upper rate that's called the marginal lending facility rate, and that's where a bank has to go if it cannot or does not want to obtain um, liquidity in our auctions. So this is in some sense like the discount window in the US. That's where your bank has to go and pay a penalty um, um, for liquidity. There's also a lower rate, it's called the deposit rate, except for some reason a bank has, um, that's okay, I think I speak loud enough now. You want me? Because uh, we're taping. Okay, so oh, so you're taping, okay, taping. sorry, sorry, then I should not move, okay. Um, there's the, um, there's the um, deposit rate, that's the money at which you can bring back to the ECB. Um, you get less than you would get if you lend it. So as you saw here, there's basically um, nobody brings money back to the ECB in normal times. You just rather lend it out because there's a, there's a penalty again for that. Now, as of the Lehman event, um, what we did is we abandoned the auctions. So a bank can come to us and get as much liquidity as it wants as long as it has collateral. And it gets that at the main refinancing operation rate. And what this did is that banks just piled up, got as much as they could, and so there's a lot of central bank money out there. And what this does then to the, um, to the rate in the market, it, there's so much liquidity out there, so much supply, that it drives the rate now very, very close to the floor. Because why borrow in the private market if you can get it from the central bank? And essentially what this means is that we are now, because we're no longer auctioning a fixed amount, we're acting as a, uh, as a lender of last resort. Because we're providing ample liquidity against collateral, arguably 
at a penalty rate because that's the, that's the rate at which you can get unlimited um, liquidity against collateral and that's the rate um, that prevails in the market. So it's not perfect, but you can make the point that the ECB acted uh, de facto as a lender of last resort to the, to the banking system. Now what we're going to exploit is the amount of liquidity that's out there over and above um, what you need to fulfill the reserve requirement. So excess liquidity that I'm plotting here, which essentially prior to the crisis was zero, on average, the banking system just held enough money to satisfy the reserve requirement. It now jumps. It jumps after Lehman to 200 billion, goes up to 400 billion, then it comes down and then we enter the second phase of the crisis. We l we're leaving the financial crisis and we're entering a sovereign debt crisis and then it jumps up to 800 billion and it's coming down. So we're exploiting the variation in, in that excess liquidity and see what does that do to the way banks trade with each other. So the research questions that we're answering here is that um, does it crowd out demand? You know, if you can get the money from the public sector, does it affect uh, how you obtain money uh, in the private marketplace? Can it actually increase supply? If there's more money out there, does it mean there's more lending going on because somebody has, has liquidity that he doesn't need for himself and he lends it out? Um, is the impact uniform across the euro area or are we creating another s set of problems because it affects certain parts of Europe or the euro area differently than, um, than others? And then actually, um, as you'll see, we'll, we'll, uh, the financial crisis doesn't play out quite like the sovereign debt crisis. These are fundamentally um, different crises and I think part of the problem in Europe is that we were unlucky to have one after the other. So, we, we, to, 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 to answer this, we have a number of, of, of problems. The first problem is that interbank market trading is over the counter, mostly. So you don't know what banks are doing with each other. Except there is um, there's something that, um, that um, has been pioneered by Craig Furfine. In the US, you can actually extract what banks do to each other in terms of lending and borrowing from the payments that, um, that are visible in the payment system, in the Fed funds. So we did that for Europe. There's the Target 2 system that I'm lucky enough to have access to. And you can basically um, try to uh, figure out what is the borrowing and lending between, between banks. Now that is, um, can be criticized. I, I spent about three years doing this by now. Um, we've done considerable uh, data quality. I'm not going to go into that, but for example, what we can do is we have access to the Spanish trading platform. All unsecured overnight tra um, interbank trading goes through a trading platform administered by the Bank of Spain. We've got that data and so we, can, we have a lab where we can check do we actually find those transactions because we know which ones are interbank transactions. We know which payments come from interbank transactions and we can check you know, do we find them, are we missing anything or are we artificially creating new ones that weren't there in the first place. And you know it's not perfect, but it's you know it's the order of 90 to 95 percent. So it's pretty good data by now. So second thing is how do we how do we identify demand and supply? What we're gonna what we're gonna use is we're gonna um, exploit prices and quantities. So we will not be able to identify the supply the, the the slope of these curves, but what we can do is we can at least get an idea of uh, is it demand or supply that's shifting if we see prices and quantities moving. So this is our data. Suppose the borrower is located in Germany and these are various weeks. And so this is the price and the quantity in one week, this is the price and quantity in another week and so on. What changes across weeks is the amount of excess liquidity in the system. You saw that line moving up and down. So what we have here is seems like a bit of a positive correlation between prices and quantities for those banks uh, in the market that are located in Germany. And this can at f you know, the first rationalization of something like a positive correlation is that we have a, a demand shift while the supply is mostly staying stable because that way we generate a positive correlation between prices and quantities. Now in other countries, it's not like that at all. Um, suppose the bank is, uh, is located in Greece. Then you see it's like all over the place. There's no obvious correlation between prices and quantities. So it seems that supply and demand curves are shifting both at the same time. So we are trying, we have the data, we have the prices and quantities, we have variation, excess liquidity, and we're trying to learn something about the supply and demand in the market. We have a final problem, is that um, the liquidity is endogenous because, you know, if there's problems in the market, 
banks come to the ECB and take out um, liquidity. So we cannot take uh, the excess liquidity um, as obviously um, exogenous. So what we do is, and I think this is really uh, something where we got a little bit lucky figuring this one out, is we exploit the institutional setting at the ECB. We do not provide liquidity continuously, we provide it at most once a week. So what happens is that on Tuesday, we have our main refinancing operations, banks tell us how much they need, this money gets transferred in the morning of the Wednesday, and from Wednesday to the next Tuesday evening, the liquidity is fixed. Yet there's trading. So it means that this week's trading is affected by the liquidity of the beginning of the week, but this trading cannot affect that week's liquidity because by the time you trade, it's fixed. It can affect next week's liquidity. So from, from today's point of view, it's, um, it's exogenous, but it can affect next week. So what we then do is we have this weekly data and we embed it in a structural VAR um, so that today's trading can affect next period's excess liquidity and we try to uh, you know, let, the, let the VAR take care of that. It's, um, it's a three variable um, where we the ordering is, it, what's important is that we have excess liquidity come first because that from that week's point of view is exogenous and then we have the, the trading in the market and we have a control that's bank risk because you would imagine that bank risk matters for prices and quantities and we try a couple of different things. We have EDFs um, at the country level, so we have the EDFs for the individual banks but then it ag gets aggregated at the country level or we have the CDSs a bit like what Sasha is doing. We have the bank CDSs and we aggregate them at the, at the country level. Um, one lag seems to be fine. So with that, <coughs> what comes out? So in the, in the next couple of slides, there's a lot of information, but the way uh, this is ordered is we have the period until mid-2011, so financial crisis always on the top panel, the sovereign crisis on the bottom panel, and then we have the impulse response functions to an excess liquidity shock first on prices, quantities, and then our rationalization in supply and demand. So for example, for the entire euro area, an excess liquidity shock of the order of 40 billion means that we're going to see a reduction in the, pri in, the, in, the, in the price and we see a reduction in volume. This is rationalized by demand shifting in. So it seems that excess liquidity crowds out demand in the market on average for the euro area. In the financial crisis, by the time the sovereign debt crisis comes, there's still some crowding out going out, but by that time there's been so much excess liquidity in the market that there's very little action going on in private markets on average. So the conclusion here is in the financial crisis, excess liquidity crowds out demand. In the debt crisis, we have a small insignificant demand effect. Now let's dig into countries. Let's look at a very non-stressed country, Germany. Germany looks exactly like the euro area on average from that point of view. So we see that the public supply of liquidity crowds out um, private demand and by the time the sovereign debt crisis comes, you know, German banks are awash with liquidity, there's, there's not that much more going on. It gets interesting when we come to stressed countries. So we are in Italy, so let's look at Italy. Uh, it turns out also be the most interesting country <laughs> from that point of view. <laughs> Things are going a little wrong. Um, so actually in the financial crisis, Italy is not different from Germany. It, it reacts exactly the same way. Excess liquidity crowds out demand, we see uh, high excess liquidity reduces prices and quantities. So that's fine. But in the sovereign debt crisis, where there wasn't so much action in Germany, in Italy what we see is that we, um, we see a reaction on the prices and not much going on on quantities. So the only way to rationalize that is to have all sorts of supply shift out while demand is shifting in. So to have a reduction in the price while quantities stay more or less the same. So what we have is that um, this excess liquidity really helped the Italian banking system in the sovereign debt crisis because it allowed, it seems to have allowed more lending to Italian banks. Spain is a bit, I mean we saw that already from Zingales' lecture, Spain is a bit like Italy, but not, uh, the interbank market is a bit more complicated, <laughs> but broadly speaking Spain looks like Italy. So we also have that in the financial crisis prior to the sovereign debt crisis, you know, the public supply of liquidity crowds out private demand, that's fine. And in the sovereign debt crisis, we also see a reduction in the prices, it's a little less significant, 
uh, while quantities stay the same. And so, again, our provision of liquidity seems to have helped the supply, expand the supply um, of interbank lending to, um, to banks located in Spain. And finally, um, as a courtesy to the panel president and uh, <laughs> co-author, mentor, everything, we do Greek. Greece, uh, Greece is the problem is that there's not much going on. It's simply a very, very small market. I mean, it's really, really tiny. I mean, Greece is 2% of Euro area GDP, so, you know, the interbank market is very small. Financial crisis, Greece is fine. I mean, Greece looks like everybody else. Um, by the time we have the, uh, we have the financial, with the sovereign debt crisis, um, uh, there's not much going on anymore. The market is virtually gone by now in Greece. And, and anyway, uh, Greek problems are not necessarily Greek banks, but somewhere else. So Greece is, uh, there's not much you can, you can tease out of that. So the summary of the results. We asked whether um, excess liquidity crowds out demand. Yes, in particular during the financial crisis. Can it help in terms of promote lending? Yes, and exactly where you would maybe hope for it i.e. in the sovereign debt crisis in stressed countries. Um, problem is that, I mean, it's not a problem. I mean, this is by design. It's good that the effect is heterogeneous across the euro area because the problems were heterogeneous. But again, we have, a, you know, we have a uniform monetary policy that has very heterogeneous effects throughout the euro area. So that can create um, problems. And um, you see that the sovereign debt crisis is a very different animal from the financial crisis. It, you really see these country characteristics also showing up in how our lending of last resort affects interbank um, market trading depending on where the borrower is located. So to conclude, um, um, I think even though this is a bit non-standard and that's definitely where my non-ECB hat should be on here because um, we really did act as a, as a um, lender of last resort even though this was not officially how our policy uh, was, um, communication was at that time, by now we've softened it a little bit. Um, we have access to pretty good data that allows us to really look at the interbank market. And I think we, um, we, we exploited the institutional setting of these weekly auctions to get some, some, um, um, some headway in, in, um, in, in creating some exogeneity in the, um, in the excess liquidity. And by tracing out of how this provision of excess liquidity affects interbank ma market uh, trading, <laughs> we hope to have shown you know, how it really works and what are the potential benefits and limits um, of, of such intervention.